Well, we have a very distinguished guest today, uh, as you know. He is also speaking tonight at school. Uh, we're pleased to have him and a colleague of his here on the campus. Uh, but uh, I've asked uh, Jack Capizzi to introduce him. So join me in welcoming Jack to the podium. Today, we are pleased to welcome Mr. John Dean to MBA. Over the course of his lengthy career inside and outside of politics, John Dean has developed an admirable reputation for the complex role he played in the cover-up and subsequent investigation of the Nixon administration following the burglary at the Watergate Hotel on June 16, 1972. Although many Americans are familiar with the basic details surrounding the Watergate scandal, few know the brave act taken by John Dean. Then a member of the President's Council, John Dean warned Nixon that a cancer was growing on the presidency and urged the president to come clean. Following the Watergate scandal, John Dean has gone on to become a prolific writer and columnist, publishing such books as Blind Ambition, The White House Years, and his most recent work, The Nixon Defense, What He Knew and When He Knew It. John Dean played a role in one of the most important events, political or otherwise, of the 20th century, and we are fortunate to get to hear from him today. Please join me in welcoming Mr. John Dean. I think you got my screen. Let's go back to the beginning here. There we go. What I thought I'd do this morning in the, uh, the very brief visit we're going to have is to share uh, some insights about government, also some insights about going to an all-boys school, which I happen to do. I went to a place called Stanton Military Academy. Uh, about 500 students, actually a phenomenal location. Uh, it's on the top of a hill and there's a Mary Baldwin College is at the bottom, which is a, a girls school. And they liked the property so well, they made the owners of the school an offer a few years ago. They couldn't refuse and, and got the school from them, which uh, we tried to prevent some of the alums, but not. Here's a picture of, uh, of the swimmers uh, that I uh, spent about three years with, and I put that picture up because these guys became friends who would affect my life and I would affect their life uh, throughout our lifetimes so far. Uh, here we are 50 years later, uh, and, and we one of the group we lost, uh, the fellow up behind me uh, with his hands on my shoulders, uh, and I never realized until he called me shortly before he passed that the impact I'd had on his life. Uh, it was kind of interesting to learn that when he uh, was in Stanton, his parents were very successful, and suddenly as he was headed off to college, uh, they lost everything. I, he, uh, his name was Doc, uh, a nickname, and he decided not to go to college, couldn't afford it, went in the Army. I just happened to be in Washington in grad school uh, when he got out of the Army, and he was about to go to work, and I said, well, Doc, aren't you going to go to college? And he said, no, I can't afford to. Well, I was working out with the swimming team at American University in Washington, and I knew the coach real well. Uh, I was really just sort of there to keep in shape and not really to compete, but uh, enjoyed it when I did with the, with the uh, kids in the school. And I said, I've got a swimmer for you. You need on your, on your team, because Doc had just come out of the special services in the Army and set a couple records, uh, as he had when we were swimming together. Got him a full scholarship, four years there, came out and became one of the most successful stockbrokers in Washington, representing major unions and made a fortune and never forgot how he got in college. Anyway, we can affect each other. It's amazing how it happens. Uh, the, the fellow on my right uh, was my roommate and also on the relay team. And about the time we approached driver's license age, we used to be going up to visit his father in Washington. He had one of the neatest cars I'd ever seen the first year the, the Thunderbird came out. 
and he'd rigged his car up with what looked like the cockpit of an of a airplane because he was a ham radio operator. He was also a jet pilot. In fact, I think he's flown everything that ever had a jet engine as well as things that didn't have jet engines. But one of the neatest things was he was a part of a club in Washington that I didn't know anything about. And when Barry Jr. and I used to go up to visit his father in the U.S. Senate, uh, he would take us around. I said, boy, this is a really pretty interesting place. And I was impressed with the reaction people had to him. And I said, you know, this government is pretty interesting work. I was in law school when his father became the 1964 nominee for president. Uh, and while Barry Jr. asked me to be in the campaign, I could not drop out of law school to do it, but uh, followed it. I, they did not think they were going to win, but thought they would have a big impact on the Republican Party, which they did. I put this picture in for a couple reasons. Um, first of all, it's historic that Barry Jr. on the far right and his father were both in the Congress at the same time. Uh, Barry in the House of Representatives representing Burbank in California, his father representing the senator from Arizona. Uh, I was then about the number 13th man in the Department of Justice uh, as an associate deputy attorney general, and Barry and I lived across the street from each other and shared addresses with uh, ladies we met uh, as we made our travels. This was, his, uh, this was his bachelor party, and I was obviously spellbinding them and telling some stories he didn't want to be told. Uh, but more importantly, he introduced me to the pretty lady on the left there, who he said he'd met in California, and he said, we went out a couple times, it just didn't work, uh, but maybe he said, here's her number, give it a try, it might. It did, we've been married for 50 some years almost. Uh, so. <laughs> Again, another reason to appreciate your friends. His dad was very much involved in Watergate. The scene here is at the end of Watergate where the, the senator uh, was designated by the others in the Republican leadership to come down and tell Richard Nixon that he didn't have a prayer if these events ended up in going to impeachment uh, and a trial in the Senate. Nixon took his word, uh, and that's when, of course, the resignation would occur. That, this is a picture on, in, uh, I think, about the 2nd or 3rd of April, or, or August of, of 1974. So quickly, what was Watergate? Well, it was certainly more than a really timeless apartment building in Washington, D.C., an office, hotel, condominium complex. Uh, and the first definition I ever saw of Watergate, I never forgot. It was in a dictionary right after Watergate when I happened to open it up and was kind of thumbing through it and saw it defined. Watergate was a scandal involving the abuse of presidential power occurring during the presidency of Richard Nixon. It doesn't tell us much about it, uh, but certainly is a broad overview. Watergate starts with the bungled Watergate break-in uh, on June 17th of 1972 and goes through a cover-up trial uh, which occurs uh, some 928 days later. Put this picture up here to show you the, the complex of the, uh, of the Watergate. The white building across the street from the Watergate uh, buildings it was a Howard Johnson, that's where the burglars and wiretapper had their operations. They went in this, the time they were arrested, the second time, to try to place a bug uh, and take photos of, a, uh, of the chairman of the Democratic National Committee's uh, material. It was a fishing expedition. A lot of mystery about what happened, and in fact, there is almost no mystery. It was just a pure bungled operation, as it was much of the cover-up. 
Uh, as I say, June 17th to January 1, 900 days of scandal. I've been looking for years at a book called The Rules of Scandal to try to understand the mechanics of scandal. And I found a pretty good definition of scandal and putting scandal in the bigger picture of what happens uh, in life. And scandals are ways societies, elites, can deal with middle-level wrongdoing. By that I mean it's certainly not anything that's comparable to our Holocaust in our history, nothing similar to the Boston Marathon bombing. Uh, but at the other end of scandals, where you see wrongdoing, you begin to wonder why this Watergate gate affectation or suffix that ends up on a lot of these. I'm thinking, for example, of uh, some of you may recall Tom Brady's uh, deflate gate, where they questioned his uh, uh, having footballs softened so he could get a better pass off. Well, I thought I would share one bit of inside information with you this morning, having an insider here from Watergate about the suffix that is now used. It actually uh, is something that a former Nixon speechwriter picked up and saw as an opportunity to lessen the impact of Watergate, Watergate being something of the mother of all modern political scandals. Uh, Bill Sapphire, after he left the White House, became an op-ed writer at the, at the New York Times. He sort of handled the conservative side of, uh, of the paper. And he also has a, had a political dictionary. He recently passed away. Uh, but he cranked out this political dictionary, and I found in it that he explained uh, the uh, gate construction as a device to provide a sinister label to a possible scandal. Uh, he goes on and says, after Watergate, and this is what he discovered, a scandal in France dealing with the, uh, the, the alteration of, of, of Bordeaux wines prompted the French to call it Winegate, as he said it happened right after Watergate. So then he adds a sentence here that I found kind of interesting. This led to the adoption of the gate suffix as a scandalizer in other fields. Well, the, uh, this lead was actually led by Bill Sapphire. And he did it and, and successfully, uh, adding the suffix gate to any and most all scandals uh, to try to lessen the impact of Watergate. So as a result, we've had uh, things like Korea Gate and Billy Gate during the Carter presidency. Uh, Korea Gate was when the uh, Korean CIA became involved with with uh, both Congress and some in the Carter administration. Billy Gate was when uh, the president's brother, who not only had his own brand of Billy beer, but also uh, got tied in with the Libyans, and uh, was something of a constant scandal, so they gave him the Billy Gate uh, label. Also, we've had Monica Gate, of course, when uh, Monica Lewinsky had her affair as an intern with Bill Clinton. Uh, and more recently, we have Russia Gate, which hasn't fully stuck yet uh, in the Trump administration, where they're trying to put the, uh, the suffix on whether or not there was collusion between the uh, Trump administration as a campaign and the Russian hacking of the last election. But Watergate's living leg legacy is certainly more than the suffix gate that's been attached to actual and perceived uh, misconduct. Uh, we have obviously uh, pushed over some limits that I thought uh, even uh, we'd ever see as, as entertainment uh, with the series scandal. But what I looked at and found amazing is how many scandals we've had. Pre-Watergate, there were about, and this is, this is over 100 years I looked, about two scandals a year that really hit the radar. Uh, Post-Watergate, we've had about 20, which is pretty phenomenal. I don't know if it's just the media noticing more or if, in fact, there has been more scandalous behavior. Uh, the news media 
uh, does like the suffix for all things scandal, uh, but it, it doesn't tell us very much about the impact uh, that uh, Watergate had both short term and long term. So let's just visit those quickly as we work our way out here. Short term, nothing was greater than the resignation of a president. There's Nixon's resignation letter on August 9th, a simple one sentence letter to the Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, where he says, I hereby resign the office of President of the United States. Following that, there were lots of laws written, strict new campaign laws that did not survive for no sinister reason. Only the Supreme Court found that they didn't comply with the First Amendment. The effect of Watergate on the media was tremendous. How many people here have seen the movie All the President's Men? Still holds up pretty well for those of you who've seen it. Bob Redford, who collected the uh, material and, and the reporters who he thought would make into a good movie, recently in 2012 revisited Watergate uh, to see what the impact on journalism wa was. One of the persons he came to was yours truly. Uh, so here's a little clip of that. The Post was the sole person really focusing on this story. We knew that. And what I realized at the time, and it's even clearer today, is what they did is they kept Watergate alive. They kept it of interest and importance in the Beltway. Members of Congress are reading about it. Uh, the judges are reading about it, the prosecutors are reading about it, Department of Justice is reading about it, FBI agents were reading about it. Had they not done that, uh, maybe there wouldn't have been the same investigation. Maybe it would have turned out very differently. Uh, you'll notice my voice changes as the narration continues. They had me in there for about five hours on film, so the voice gets a little different. There was this relief that somehow uh, the system had worked. And then there were, in the aftermath, a lot of reforms that were put in place. The media changed. Uh, investigative journalism had been an incidental situation pre-Watergate, post-Watergate. It is the, uh, it, it almost becomes a standard. Presidents before Watergate had been, really by most reporters, been given a presumption of innocence. In the aftermath, they're almost presumed guilty. It really dramatically changes the relationship of the news media with the president. I noticed those glasses I was wearing were full glasses. That was in, uh, I'd forgotten exactly um, when that was, 2012. Um, since then, I've had one of the pleasures of getting older is cataracts. When you hear about cataracts, don't feel sorry for anybody. I, I had the process, and I now have better than 20-20 vision, uh, but changed my glasses, and that made me flash on an incident I had when I started wearing these glasses. I was going through LAX. As a high-profile person, people come up to you, you get used to it after a while, and this guy kind of hums and haws, and he finally gets the guts and comes up to say something to me. And what he said is one of those things I will never forget. He said, didn't you used to be Vice President Dick Cheney? <laughs> That's how well I recognize you. Flame is. And the uh, investigative journalism I mentioned was short-lived. That was over within a decade because not only is it expensive, uh, but not everybody likes it. But no question the media relationship changed. I put CNN in there because I'm now a, uh, an on-air contributor at CNN. The Trump administration has uh, resulted in CNN in hearing echoes of Watergate, so they've asked me to come out and do commentary on that. The, the last time that happened was uh, back in during the Clinton administration when I was an anchor buddy for uh, Brian Williams during the Clinton Lewinsky uh, affair. I don't know why they thought I'd have particular expertise in that, but it was fascinating. Spent more time in Washington than since I've left. No question, though, however, that all presidents have been affected by Watergate. Let's wrap up here with a couple books you might, if you get interested in this subject, want to look at. Stanley Cutler did a great book on, on uh, 
They're called The Wars of Watergate. Woodward has done a number of books on Watergate. Shadows showed its impact on uh, presidents that uh, uh, followed. Barry Sussman, who was, was a editor for uh, the Washington Post, did one of the best, very brief summaries of the Watergate cover-up. Um, Fred Emery, a BBC uh, and London Times writer, does a wonderful job. Uh, Ken Hughes from the uh, University of Virginia was one of the first to spot what has only been confirmed this year is that Richard Nixon indeed in 1968 during his 68 campaign interfered with Lyndon Johnson's effort to bring peace in Vietnam, uh, a war that had already killed 30,000 Americans would kill another 20,000 when Nixon uh, was trying to get an honorable peace. I don't think he was trying to protract the war, but he sure didn't have the secret plan he claimed he had that got him elected. Uh, Bob Woodward's last book on, on Watergate w dealt with Alex Butterfield, the person who revealed the taping system. Uh, I did a book uh, based on that taping system when almost uh, four decades after Watergate, nobody had ever bothered to collect and even catalog all of the Nixon secret Watergate conversations. There were, were four million words. Uh, had I known going in, I would have never taken the project on. But working with a group of grad students, uh, we got them all transcribed. There's some books that aren't worth your time. Secret Agenda uh, has a CIA theory of Watergate that makes no sense. Uh, Silent Coup uh, claims that my wife was involved in Watergate, which uh, amazed us all and really kind of annoyed me, so I sued them for defamation for nine years and finally got a, a settlement that uh, uh, I can, can't tell you what it is, I can tell you I'm satisfied by it, though. <laughs> the, uh, the, big, the biggest impact of Watergate clearly has been on lawyers, and that's what brings me to Nashville. Uh, legal ethics changed dramatically. Law schools now have to have ethics training. Those of you who go on to law school, be, you'll find out because of my testimony before the Senate and the fact that 21 lawyers got on the wrong side of the law uh, resulted in law schools realizing they had to teach more than I got when I was in law school, which said don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, and by all means don't advertise was the big issue. Uh, there are special uh, bar exams for ethics alone that are all the same uh, multiple choice exam has to be taken by all law students before they can get their license. Uh, there is a requirement for continuing legal education, which is what brings Jim and I here. Uh, we put together a program some seven years ago, expecting to do a couple of them. We do no advertising, no marketing, pure word of mouth, and we've done over 120 of these where we take uh, incidents from Watergate and we take the rules that came post Watergate and apply them back to those situations and raise the issue how might it have been differently had these rules been in, in existence uh, during Watergate and we find some surprising result. Let me close by pulling a, 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 a just a very brief remark from Nixon's farewell speech. Uh, Jim and I have talked about this and we had agreed this might have been Nixon's greatest speech. Most of it was extemporaneous. He'd obviously thought about some of it the night before, uh, but it's just brutal and raw Nixon and you get his real feelings. And I think this is one of the most important things he says during this speech and uh, it's something we can all take away from it. It's only a beginning, always. The young must know it. The old must know it. It must always sustain us. Because the greatness comes 
not when things go always good for you, but the greatness comes and you're really tested when you take some knocks, some disappointments, when sadness comes. Because only if you've been in the deepest valley can you ever know how magnificent it is to be on the highest mountain. May your mountains in life be high and your deep valleys be few. Thank you.